Wahguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Wahguru Ji Ki Fateh. Welcome to the Sikh Youth Show, Sikh Channel, Sky 748, each and every Wednesday. Today we have a really, really important show for you today. So please let all your family and friends know, send out a message to tune in straight away. It's, we've, we've come, our team have come out to Rotherham today. And as you know, in recent years, the massive scandal of Rotherham where reports were made of young, uh, vulnerable children who were abused and exploited around the area and across the country. So today we have one of the survivors who's uh, really popular within the uh, community and social media right now and she just released a book called Just a Child. We've got today with us is Sammy Woodhouse. Welcome to the show Sammy. Oh, thank you for having me. Sammy is a survivor from the Rotherham scandal and today we're going to be asking her a bit about her background and upbringing in Rotherham and how this all came about. So Sammy, um, welcome to the show and we want to thank you for coming on and being brave and speaking out to the all the viewers out there because within the Sikh community a lot of people see this as a, such a taboo issue yeah. and they don't want to speak out so um, bringing you here and letting them see what actually happened out there and you know how you've turned your life around mm. and you know you're making a difference in the community now and this is what we're trying to do as an organization from CQ UK by doing the DVDs and the grassroots work mm. um, you know just let the viewers and the uh, sound know about um, your upbringing in Rotherham and how it was well, um, I grew up here in Rotherham. I lived with my mum, my dad, and I've got two older sisters as well. And I came from just a normal, everyday kind of family. And there's a lot of people that think that you can only be abused if you're, you know, from a really bad background or if you're in a care home, and that's not true. But um, as a child growing up, I was very confident. I was bubbly. I had lots of friends. There was nothing vulnerable about me apart from the obvious. You know, that was I was just a child. But I'm at school, I was uh, I really enjoyed school as well and I, I was really good, I got a lot of good grades, so I was getting, you know, C, Bs and As. And, uh, but my passion was dancing, so from the age of four up to 12, I would go around the country, you know, competing for my little gold medals. And, um, and that's what I always thought I was going to be, you know, when I was older, so I had all my life mapped out. Uh, but unfortunately I stopped dancing when I was about 12, and that's when everything started to go downhill for me. So I wasn't a girl training every day, it was really intense training. And um, I started hanging about on the streets, uh, you know, just with kids of my own age, friends that I'd been with, um, you know, friends for a very long time. And um, I started to hang about just on my local shop. And I was there just after my 14th birthday, and um, a guy started to drive up the street in a, a sports car. He got out and he started talking to my friends. And um, it wasn't the first time my, my friend had met him, so he wasn't a complete stranger to her, but he was to me. But I knew his brother a little bit, so, um, you know, of course, as a child, you think, oh, if my friend knows a friend of a friend, then, uh, you know, you think you know them as well. So when he asked us if we wanted to go for a spin in the car, we said, yeah, uh, we just thought, you know, have a bit of fun, everything will be fine. Uh, but unfortunately, that was the moment that changed my life forever and I were going to be abused mentally, sexually and physically for several years and I was also going to commit crime as well. So, just going back to the, that key point, uh, she was a young girl at 14, only 14 and you know we need to keep an eye and be vigilant on you know what our kids are doing at that age and you know who they're speaking to be it Sammy was going out on the streets, the, people are talking to people on their phones, on social media now, there's yeah. a lot of dangers out there. But you know, um, just let us know how, you know, I know it's probably a sore subject to talk about, but how bad did it get and, you know, you know, what was the, like, what was his motives, what was going on in your head at the time? Well, it got really bad, um, but you know, the first thing that started was the grooming process and I always say that grooming is one of the most dangerous crimes because it's silent and it happens without you even knowing it's actually happening, but also for, you know, for the child it's actually very fun. Um, so he came into my world and he found out everything there was to know about me, you know, who I was, my family, where they worked, where I went to school, my friends were, what I liked. And it turns out we had a lot in common. You know, he liked all the same things that I did. And also, um, a lot of my friends seemed to, you know, know his friends as well. So it was almost as if it was meant to be. 
but um, he paid me lots of compliments and um, you know, as a child that's really nice and he always made me feel really grown up and uh, I remember always thinking as a child I couldn't wait to leave home, you know, be a lot older, have my own place, my own job. So when, um, you know, that kind of attention was really nice and it's a different kind of attention you get from your parents. You know, I came from a loving family and, um, you know, my mum was more like my best friend than, than her parents. Yeah. So it, it's completely different. But um, then once he had all that information, he then took me into his world, which of course was very different to mine. Um, he became very controlling. Um, it was very dangerous, you know, he was known to all the authorities okay. um, and he wasn't just involved in exploiting children like myself, he was involved in just about every crime you can imagine, so dealing drugs, dealing cars, robberies, armed robberies, uh, you know, you name it, he was involved in it and he wasn't operating on his own either, he was part of a gang, so family members, friends um, and, you know, I wasn't the only child. There was, um, you know, a lot of children involved being exploited, not just white children, not just girls, there was boys as well, and people from different races. This wasn't something that was a secret, it was very well known, uh, you know, lots of people knew it was going on, and parents were trying to do something just like my parents were, and, um, you know, they, they were being told, well, actually, we're not going to do anything. And, uh, I mean, my parents found out within days of me meeting him, they reported it to the police. The police said that um, I was making a lifestyle choice and because at that time I wouldn't make a statement, they said that there was nothing that they could do. Now, of course, at that time I didn't want to make a statement. You know, I'm this, this child that's having the time of my life to begin with. Um, I couldn't say anything wrong with it. I thought this man was my boyfriend, he loved me, cared about me. I thought my mum and dad were just, you know, trying to give me a hard time. Yeah. Um, um, if you look at that key moment there, do you think like at that time, and you know, if there's people out there watching right now mm. who whose pe parents are concerned, mm. you know, um, I want you to give them a couple of examples of tactics being used, mm. and then also, you know, like you, you said that you genuinely didn't think mm. there was anything wrong with this. Yeah. You know, those young girls out there who might be in a relationship mm. but don't know what the crimes being committed against yeah, them. Yeah, it's so know? hard to, to actually know that you're, you're being groomed and again I think that's why it makes it the perfect crime because it's so difficult for you know that child to actually recognise well actually this is wrong, you know there's all the compliments, the attention, the gifts um, you know once they really suck you in that's it, you know you're in and it's so difficult to get out of it. Of course. So, um, so uh, a message to the parents, what sort of tactics would um, a perpetrator use to coerce their child maybe? I think um, again you know it's about that attention, that flattery as well um, and what we know from Rotherham and you know not just Rotherham throughout the country is um, they very much like to keep the child isolated, yes. you know break down those relationships with parents, with friends and one thing that was really common is they was telling the child you know to make things up about parents or family members to get them into care because once they're in care uh, they've actually got more free access to that child. Wow, so as um, as, as an organisation right now we've got like 30 something cases mm. and some of the tactics that are being used is to isolate the, the child or the vulnerable adult away from her family mm. so she's in a system so they've got full access and the parents and any loved ones who are near them have no access. Yeah, that's something that's very common. As well, uh, what people need to, to know about, not just parents but schools as well, is that perpetrators are actually ringing the schools, changing the contact numbers, so say if a child um, missing from school, which of course happens yeah. a lot, um, when schools send out a message thinking it's going to parents to let them know that the child's not in school, well actually it's not going to the parents, it's going to the perpetrators. So the parents aren't actually aware, you know, where the children is. They think they're safe, they're in school, and that everything's fine. So we need to be careful when you're uh, dropping your kids off school. Just how can the system, like with the education department here, mm -hmm. is um, meant to be monitoring yeah. where the kids are and who is so? Is there should there be more communication with the parents and the education departments? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, I met with Department for Education uh, because what as well what we need to be doing is going in there to schools um, and you know and talking to kids. You know, telling them what is a healthy and safe relationship about peer pressure, respect. 
um, you know, a, a child's got a right to, to have all that knowledge. Now, I'm not saying that's going to stop uh, abuse from happening, because of course we can't put that responsibility on the children. Um, but I think um, you know it could help encourage people to come forward, report, tell someone. Because a lot of people, you know, children, they don't know who to turn to. They think it's either police, social services. Nobody trusts all that police or social services. Um, you know that that's a known fact. That's been going on for decades and will continue to do so. Definitely. So, um, from your experience, uh, we're just touching on the system here now. Mm. And you know the system. I've witnessed there is flaws. Yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, let's just go from experience, like from the Rotherham scandal. How bad was the system? Um, it was totally unfit for purpose, totally corrupt. Um, you know, we're not just talking about people not understanding grooming. We're talking about being involved in raping children, turning a blind eye. And um, you know, for many different reasons, we know now that people are scared to be called racist because the majority of the perpetrators were Pakistani Muslims. Um, and what we also know through court cases and reports is that actually some of the professionals was actually involved in raping the children as well. That's horrific. So some of the professionals, um, what kind of professionals were they like in what departments? Uh, police officers, uh, counsellors, um, you know, people that worked within the council such as social workers. Um, so they would cover this up? Yeah. Um, and what we know now is that there was um, a minimum of 1,400 children, like myself, um, you know, we was beaten, raped, tortured, um, you know, sold, blamed, ignored and covered it all up. And the thing is, you know, some people think, oh, it only happens in Rotherham. It's not. It happened in every town and city around the country, not just around the country, but around the world. Definitely, um, and it's been happening for countless years. Yeah. And um, you know, Rotherham was just the tip of the iceberg. That was just mm. a, that was a big scandal coming out. You've got Telford, you've got um, Newcastle. Bradford, Newcastle, the Newcastle yeah. gang, Peterborough gang. I think uh, two weeks ago, the Derby gang just got caught in Burton yeah. area. So um, there is a, you know, it, it's not nowhere safe. Yeah, no, that's true. And as well, you know, it's not just happening on streets. Uh, what we know is that majority of abuse actually happens in the family home by people we know. Yeah. And then of course we've got um, some cheesy access online now. Uh, when it was happening to me, we didn't have things such as Facebook, Instagram, you know, all those things. Um, so as much as social media can be a great thing, it's opened up a lot of doors and makes it so easy for paedophiles. Of course it does. So um, uh, there's cases where I've, I've witnessed where a young girl was messaged on uh, social media, Instagram. Mm. Within six weeks, she had left home, isolated from her family, and you know the perpetrators had full access to her. You yeah. know, what's your views and opinions on that? It's so easy to do. I mean, you can set up a fake account in what about thirty seconds. Um, so a lot of children think that you know someday who they're talking to it on the other side um, is actually a child as well. You know, they'll put on a child image. Uh, they think they're just talking to somebody the same age, they'll say, oh, let's go meet up, you know, let's go to park or whatever. Uh, that's it, they meet up, and they're not actually meeting a child, they're meeting a paedophile. Um, going back to your journey, and obviously it was, um, uh, must have been a difficult time for yourself and your family. I've read your book, and you know, some of the uh, stuff your family were going through, your mum, your dad, mm -hmm. your dad, um, you know, confronted the perpetrator at yeah. certain times. Yeah. You know, um, he had the snooker club, he had to get rid of it. You know, there was a lot of trying to take you out on holidays just to try and take your mind away from that lifestyle that you knew. You know, how bad did it get? Um, it got really bad and, um, you know, it, it kind of got to the point where he was, you know, he was beating me all the time and he was threatening uh, to kill me as well. So, and I tried to leave him at many occasions and there was one occasion where I tried to leave him and he grabbed me by my hair into the car and he started speeding towards the top of the street and he drove through two parked cars and into a church where I got rushed to hospital. I was actually pregnant with my second child at that point as well. So I got pregnant um, first of all when I was 14 and then again when I was 15. But there was another occasion where again I tried to leave him and um, we was in the car and he started driving towards the edge of a hilltop and he said he was going to drive off it and kill us both. And um, right at the last moment, he slammed on the brakes. And still to this day, I don't know how he didn't go over the edge. But um, I got out of the car. I was physically sick. And then he took me to the edge and said he was going to throw me off. And I honestly thought, you know, that was it. That was the moment my life was going to end. And I was that scared I weed myself. 
and then he put me into the back of the car, had sex with me, as though nothing at all had just happened. And I'll never forget that moment because how I felt. And I remember just laying there crying and I had this constant pain. Um, you know, I knew it was from him. I knew I had to get away from him, but I was just so emotionally attached to him and I just I just couldn't quite figure it out how to do it. But I just felt like a dead body on a slab in the morgue. And emotionally I just started to close down. And I weren't this, you know, this perfect little child that my dad had said about me in court anymore. Um, you know, I was, I was angry, I was lashing out at people. But what I wanted people, you know, to see through all that anger um, is what well, actually underneath all that. They were just a scared little girl uh, that was just really confused, really hurt, and needed help. And, you know, listening to all that is probably took its toll from the viewers out there and it must affect them. Uh, emotionally, you know, it's got me, it's not nice to hear this and mm. to go through it. There's so many people out there probably going through this right now, you know. The, they might not watch this right now, but they might get to see this video after and obviously we'll push it out as much as we can. But you, what advice would you give to anyone who is in an abusive relationship right now or maybe being groomed and they, they think they know that they're in control when they're not? Yeah, I thought I was in control, uh, you know, I thought I knew everything, no one could tell me anything. I tell them to reach out and speak to someone. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, the police or a social worker, even though, you know, it's a crime, it does need to be reported. But, um, you know, reach out to people in the communities, you know, people like yourself. Um, you know, sometimes people feel more comfortable talking to somebody that they, they can just talk to on a level. There's support services available. If people want to speak out anonymously, you know, there's lines online that they can do that. But I think it's always just so important to reach out and tell someone. Of course, definitely. And um, having yourself come on the show, especially to the Sikh community, you know, what advice, obviously, you know, like speaking to us and we obviously will be working together to push as much awareness we can out there. What would you advise to the Sikh families or the Sikh young children who might be going through this? There's a lot of families that think that they can't reach out and tell somebody because it might bring shame to them and I get so many people contact me telling me that. And you know, what I want those people to, to understand is, you know, this is children or, or adults being really, really hurt and there, there's no shame in, in reaching out. In fact, I think it actually takes a lot of courage and strength to reach out and tell somebody. And, uh, you know, again, um, it's, it's just so important to reach out and tell somebody because not only could you, you know, make a difference to someone's life, you could actually save somebody's life, um, you know, report it and, and make it stop. Of course. Um, uh, it's really brave what you've done and how far you've come because you. you're turning and changing people's lives by making books like this, Just a Child, and I've read it and it's powerful. So, um, you know, you've done your book launch mm -hmm. um, and you've written this powerful journey that you went through. Um, you're a survivor and we need more survivors out there speaking the truth. So I ha um, just let people know about the book and, you know, how it was writing it. Yeah. Um, it was probably one of the most hardest things I've done actually doing the book. I didn't realise just how difficult it had to be because I had to put myself back there emotionally. And what was really important for me is when the reader was reading it, um, I wanted them to be on a journey with me. You know, I wanted them to be 14-year-old Sammy uh, with all the highs and the lows. Um, and I hope that's, that's come across. But, um, yeah, it was so difficult, but um, I feel so much better in doing it. I feel like I've got a weight off my shoulder. Um, and as well, it's you know the fact that it's helped people, and that's what I wanted. But I also wanted people to actually understand grooming, because you know there's, there's so many of us that don't actually understand it, um, and you can't tackle something if you don't understand it. But as well, what I wanted to to get out there is just how much it does affect families. It doesn't just affect the victims; it's the families as well, and you know it ripped my family apart. And um, there's a lot of parents out there; they don't know who to turn to or you know what to do and so many parents get blamed uh, you know it always must be something bad that they've done or you know that they've done something wrong and I'm not saying for one second that you know all parents are fantastic because we know that some parents are actually responsible for abusing the children um, but you know they, they shouldn't always be the first ones to get the finger pointed at them. Of course the blaming game you know I've sat in meetings with social services I've seen how they've blamed 
survivor, the victims there mm. in front of me. I've seen them, officers, when you're trying to report something, and they've been very dismissive of the young child, mm. saying, um, we'll prioritise this when and if, you know, if there's another priority that comes first to the victim. How bad do you think that is? It's really bad and very damaging long term as well. It's victim blaming. And, um, you know, for, for most of my life, I heard words such as, oh, you're a slag, you're a packy shagger, you're a whore. And those words stick with you. Words are very powerful. And I started to believe, you know, that, that negative. Um, and I became a very negative person. And when I spoke out, um, I think it was about 27, um, I started, you know, hearing positive things about myself. You know, I was brave, I was strong. And I started to believe that and it changed my life. Um, so, I, I, you know, I want everybody to realise just how powerful words actually are. Of course, definitely. Um, uh, we've got a few minutes left, so um, uh, one thing I want to touch on is um, when the you had to go to court mm. and uh, the scandal came to light and, you know, all of it, just touch on all of that and the conviction side. So, yeah, the, um, the court case uh, was two and a half years uh, to get to court, so it was very long, but it was a, a very big court case. I think over a hundred witnesses in total. Uh, Twenty-one, I think, was victims. Uh, the first trial, there was eight defendants. Two got found not guilty, which left six, and two of those was women. People think that only men can commit these crimes, and that's not true. Women are very much involved as well. Um, so, Arsh had a sin, which was a man that abused me and lots of others. He got the highest sentence at 35 years. Um, which I think for us that was a great sentence. I mean, of course, he should never get out of prison, but there's been lots of people, in fact, majority of people that commit these crimes and get out just after a few years. But, um, you know, that, that was a great moment to, to get justice, and I thought to myself, well, actually, this is going to be the day where my life starts to change. But I continue to speak out, and I still do, because um, you know, it, it's kind of just made me realise how much of a difference people like myself and the other girls, because they weren't just me, um, you know, what change we, we've actually fetched around. And, you know, people always, you know, when I go back and kind of with all the victim blaming and all the names that we was called, well, actually, it was myself and other survivors that not only exposed the scandal, um, you know, we took everyone to court, we put... Um, you know, some of the most dangerous people in the country behind bars, we campaigned, we've, we've actually changed this country in, in how we actually view CSE and we actually have conversations now um, and I think that gets dismissed a lot um, so you know I think uh, we definitely need to start and empower survivors um, you know they're not damaged goods on a shelf that should be left there with people, with daughters, with mothers, uh, you know sons, brothers um, and that gets forgotten about but um, you know this the scandal in itself and I remember when it came to light and um, you know because I've been speaking out saying this is this is a scandal and it's a cover-up so to actually have that on paper in black and white um, I just thought well no one can call me a liar again you know that's it I've proven it unfortunately people still to this day call me a liar even though I proved it in court as well um, sometimes it's always just easier for some people to blame the victim. They don't want to deal with it. They don't want to deal with the fact that we live in a country full of child rapists. Um, so of course it's always easier to blame ourselves. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, the scandal, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, but to know that there were so many professionals that are actually paid to protect us, um, that ignored, blamed, was involved, um, I think he's just shocking and what's even more shocking is that still not one person has been held to account yet, not just in Rodham but around the country either. Yeah, wow, um, uh, obviously we've come to the end of the show <coughs> and uh, it was a really powerful and emotional show. Um, just to finish off, obviously we, you've made massive differences in the community in Rodham and from the sea community we definitely need your support helping us get um, campaigning yeah. the grassroots and helping make changes so we can change policies where people know when sea girls are targeted it is racially and religiously motivated and we're going to be working with Sammy to try and make a difference in the community. Any final words to the viewer Sammy? Yeah what I want everyone to know is that um, anyone can be a victim to this and 
unfortunately we, we have an image at the moment that it only happens to little white girls in care homes and I just want everybody that's listening to know that you know it can be happening to, to your child so um, you know it's always so important to keep alert and as well I think it's so important that people in government are actually working you know with people like ourselves because we know what's happening on these streets we're not in this little Westminster bubble that a lot of people in, in power are um, you know we, we need to be working together Definitely. Um, I want to thank you for coming to the show, on the show, and um, obviously we're in Rotherham today. Uh, make sure you share this video and let everyone know. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. Bye, Guji Ka Khalsa. Bye, Guji Ki Fateh.